Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ahkam SOS, the show that discusses Islamic practices and duties by His Eminence, the Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi. My name is Mohsin Shah, I'm your host, and joining me is Sheikh Ali Ma'ash. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh Ma. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. And we're starting a new discussion today, and that is Ghusl. Sheikhna, what are the different situations where one would have to perform ghusl and it is wajib upon them? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin Ghusl is another act of worship related to other worships in which you still need to do some uh, initial requirements for the ghusl, such as the intention, the niyyah, and so forth. And ac according to how the narrations have told us to do the ghusl, how to wash, for example, and in what situations we have to use the ghusl. It's not just like the shower that we take when we come back home from work, just a quick two or three minutes shower and just we just leave. It's almost um, a purifying uh, type of shower and, and also that gives spiritual purification to, to the individual due to a certain acts that he did that he requires to be pured after he became impure spiritually. Now, the obligatory ghusl which is mentioned in the books of rulings of the ulama in overall and particularly for the Sayyid himself there are seven types of obligatory ghusl. Um, three of them related to uh, the ladies. Okay. They have certain conditions and states and situations and periods that they need to actually, uh, after that timing, they have to do ghusl for that. So out of the seven, we have three for the ladies. So we left with four. Uh, the first one is the ghusl janab, the ghusl which becomes wajib and obligatory on both sides, uh, the husband and the wife, okay. due to the intercourse and the actual, the process itself which makes uh, the man to ejaculate or even the intercourse itself even without ejaculation, would cause the person to uh, do the ghusl of janabah. That's both persons, yes? Both, of course, because okay. the, the sexual intercourse will cause um, uh, the janabah, even if from the man's side there, was, there were no ejaculations. Okay. So the, the contact itself with the other side would cause uh, the ghusl itself. So that's very important okay. to, to bear in mind. So that's the first type of, of a wajib ghusl. Um, the second type of the wajib ghusl, which is b for both male and female, it's not just for one side, uh, is the ghusl of touching a corpse. Ghusl masl mayit, as they say in Arabic. Is this a human corpse or any corpse? No, it's only the human corpse. Okay. So when you touch a dead person's body, um, then you have to do uh, a ghusl wajib uh, for, that, for that cause, for that purpose. This uh, third type of ghusl is the ghusl of the corpse itself. So the other one I mentioned, the first one, is when I touch the dead, the dead body of a, of a deceased person. The second type is now to wash the body itself of that deceased. So somebody who dies, it becomes wajib that you, have, you wash that person before you actually bury him. So this is a ghusl which is mandatory upon yourself when you're not even alive? Exactly. Okay. It becomes upon the Muslims obligatory and duty to um, wash that dead person, that Muslim, that mu'min person, and prepare his coffin and, and so forth. So the ghusl of mayyit is wajib as well. And the fourth and the last ghusl is the type of ghusl which becomes um, obligatory due to uh, certain deeds and acts, for example, or, or even utterings and, and saying something. Let's say if somebody uh, makes an oath, okay. 
that if let's say I go to the ziyara of certain imam, I would do ghusl. When I arrive there, I'll do ghusl and I'll, I'll enter the, the shrine with ghusl, for example. So this is like a qasim or a nether? Nether is one of them, yeah, they're, they're different. So we have the qasim as well that I say, you know, I swear to God, for example, in, in a certain way in Arabic, mm -hmm. that if I do this, I'll do ghusl, for example. Or if I don't do it, I do ghusl. Again, it becomes wajib. Also, uh, the covenant and pledge that, you know, I, I say uh, Allah, that I, I give a pledge or covenant, again, it becomes wajib. So these are the main types of ghusl, of wajib. And the rest of the ghusl that we have um, are mustahab and desirable, such as ghusl Jum Jum'ah, the day of Friday. It's mustahab to have the ghusl, for example. And other ghusls, I mean, let's say ghusl tawbah for those who do sins, for example. In overall, for the one to do ghusl tawbah, for example. And um, there are different types of ghusl in the month of Ramadan. Okay, that every night, I think, or every two nights, there are certain types of ghusl you do for that particular night. And many, many other ghusls of ghusl of the day of Eid, or Fatr, for example, or Adha. You have all these types of ghusl, so the ziyara of the Ma'asum, ghusl of the Prophet's uh, ziyara in Medina, for example. But the main ones are the ones I mentioned, which are wajib and obligatory. Shaykhna, ghusl al Janaba is not actually restricted just to marital relations, is it? I mean, there's other instances where you have to perform this ghusl, no? Well, there are two issues with this regard, that when uh, the ghusl of Janaba becomes wajib on the person, on the individual, to do it, um, there are two main reasons for the ghusl of Janaba. Number one, as I mentioned in the beginning, the intercourse itself, um, the contact between the male and the female, the husband and the wife, um, that makes the ghusl wajib and they have to both go and do the ghusl uh, and of course with regard to the ghusl janabah um, it becomes wajib for the purpose of the salah for the prayers the second type basically is when the, the male discharges the semen in any form if that sperm or uh, semen um, ejaculated from that person, that male person, then that becomes uh, wajib for him to do also janabah, as I said, for the purpose of the prayers. Because by itself, uh, the ghusl janabah is mustahab. Okay. It is uh, mustahab that for the one to be clean, at least spiritually, to be clean um, when he's in a state to go straight and wash uh, the ghusl of, of the janabah, as the Imam Ma'asum alayhi salam, he says, وَالْغُسْلُ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْهِ The Imam says, I would like um, to, to do the ghusl rather than sleep or just ignore it for a few hours. I would rather to go and uh, do the ghusl straight away. وَالْغُسْلُ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْهِ So the recommendation for the Ma'asum alayhi salam that we go and do the ghusl straight away. But um, you have the time, you have... Uh, um, enough time to do the ghusl unless uh, for, for the purpose, purpose of the salah, pray time, you, you got the sunrise, you got the sunset. No, you have to make sure you do the ghusl before that and you pray before that. And, and, and it's where, there where it becomes wajib and obligatory for the one to do the ghusl of janab. So, Shaykhna, when doing the ghusl of janab, what is the intention that I'm supposed to have? Is it a mustahab one or a wajib? Well, in overall, uh, for the ghusl al and likewise with the wudu, and by the means of abiding Allah's orders and duties, because the whole idea is that I'm doing ibadah here, I'm doing a ghusl that purifies my soul and my heart and my body for the purpose of entering into ibadah, worship. So I do this intention for the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaykhna, what are the that I cannot, per, you know, do. I'm, I'm prohibited from doing when I'm in the state of Janaba. Well, there are five acts which become prohibited and, and haram for the one to do while in the state of Janaba. Now, the first one is touching the script, the ayat of the Holy Quran, the verses of the Holy Quran, touching them, 
as I've mentioned with the wudu that you cannot touch likewise with the state of janab you have to make sure that you, you don't touch the verses of the Quran while you are being in this state and furthermore uh, the said adds also as a obligatory precaution ihtiyat wujubi he adds also um, the names of the prophets peace be upon them all and he also adds the names of the ma'asumin the 14 ma'asum of Ahl Bayt السلام, including Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam names and um, in which that they must not be touched so they are also as a ihtiyat wujubi they must not be touched as the sacred names of Ahl Bayt alayhi salam um, the second uh, forbidden act is to actually entering the Masjid of Al-Haram and the Masjid of An-Nabi to go and inside the, the two main mosques of the Muslims in Mecca, the Masjid Al-Haram and in Medina, the Masjid Al-Nabi and you're not allowed even to pass through them in other words to enter from one door and to leave from the other door just to pass through so the exception only of those two mosques that you can't actually even get near to them inside them and uh, pass through them and get out of them with regard to the third um, prohibition and muharram is to stop and stay let's say you want to sleep in a, in, a, in a normal mosque other than the masjid haram and masjid nabi and also to stop and stay in the shrines of Ahl Bayt the holy shrines of the Imam alayhi uh, salam that act of staying there and stopping there even if you want to stop there let's say to sit down for five minutes to answer a phone call for example or you want to sit down and see your, to have a chat with a friend that stopping and staying there is haram so you have to leave that shrine or, or the mosque uh, immediately um, with regard to these mosques and shrines, there's no objection if you want to pass through one door and leave from the other door. That's fine, just to pass through them. But you're not allowed to stay there and remain there uh, for, for even a few seconds or minutes. And the fourth um, forbidden act, also the Sayyid mentions that to enter into the mosque, with the intention of placing something, let's say you borrowed a book from the mosque library shelves and you want to return it, so you're not allowed to go there mm-hmm. and just to put the book and come out, come out, you're not allowed to put something inside the mosque. And the Sayyid says, as per obligation, uh, precaution, that it is also forbidden to even place. Um, something inside the mosque without entering it you know sometimes I can throw uh, let's say I've got a bag or, or, or a pillow or a blanket that belongs to the mosque I want to throw it to the, inside the mosque you're not allowed to do this even to this extent and this shows how the state of Janab is uh, something that is not really uh, liked by uh, the Sharia to be uh, in public, for example, that you wash and you come out, you go have a ghusl, quick shower with the ghusl of Janab, and you come out clean, pure, and you can join the society, you can join the mosques and, and the mu'mineen. And even we have a, a hadith from in the time of Imam Sadr, salam, one of the ashab, he said, I went to visit the Imam, the Imam's house. He said, When I entered the Imam's house, the Imam said, how could you come with this state? So even entering the Imam's houses while they're alive is counted as what? You know, you're not allowed. It's like, like, like a mosque. Mm-hmm. Because their they're being alive is as if they're being martyred and, and killed and, and, and died in the grave. So their shrine represents also if they're alive as well. So the Imam ordered them to leave immediately and to have the ghusl. So... You can see how it's important for the mu'min to be clean always. And the, the fifth obligatory and wajib for the 
one who has janabah not to do and it's haram to do is to read the the sajda verses of the holy okay. quran there are some sajda which are, mm -hmm. makes the uh, the person to do wajib sajda so the first surah is surah al sajda the second surah is fussilat the third surah is surah al najm and fourthly surah al alaq the best as i've mentioned the narration that if the one uh, does the wash and ghusl of janab then he can actually read these verses touch these verses and even go to the shrines and the mosques um, with confidence because purity is important you know people don't like somebody who is in a state of dirt on his face on his body to come out in the street uh, to go to a gathering for example people don't like it so spiritually as well uh, likewise Allah likes the moment to be always clean and tahir. And as the hadith of the Prophet says, النَّظَافَةُ مِنَ iman Cleanliness is a part of faith. So let's be clean at all times. Now with regard to the, the verse of the sajda, it is mustahab uh, precautionary that for the one who is in the state of junub, not to read even one letter of, of these uh, uh, of these four surahs. Uh, in other words, um, it's haram to read the verse itself, the verse of the sajda in the four surahs. But when it comes to reading the rest of the, the chapter, let's say even beginning with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, for example, uh, Surah al-Alaq, Iqra' bism rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana. So to read these verses, even one letter, it's, uh, the Sayyid says that it's, it's um, with regard to um, mustahab precaution that you don't read it, even one letter. I think some ulama said you, you can't even read the whole surah. Uh, there's a debate about uh, the ayat, uh, surah al-sajda. So it's better not to read um, even a letter from these surah, surahs except the ayat which are forbidden to read, that's something else. And it is permissible for the junub, for the one who is in the state of Janaba, if he hears, let's say he is in a majlis sitting, in the street walking, and suddenly he hears somebody is reading the ayat of sajda itself, the, the very last verses of Surah Al-Alaq, for example, which has the sajda at the end. If he hears that verse of, of sajda, um, then he should do the sujood and prostrate. Although he is in the state of janabah, but he can actually, he should, he should actually do it. Because the, the verse makes the one, the individual wajib, uh, to do the sujood upon hearing the ayat is sajda. So he must do the sajda, although it's haram for him as a junub to read the verses of, sajda, of wajib sajda. Excellent, Shaykh. Now, thank you very much for today's discussion. And thank you to all the viewers for joining us on today's discussion. If you have any questions that you'd like to send in in regards to Ahram, please send them to the contact details provided. And inshallah, we can answer those for you. Until next time, stay tahir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.